to preach today. Two out of the past uh, preaching opportunities, two out of the past three preaching opportunities here at The Journey, I have not preached. I got sick earlier in uh, or the latter part of the year last year. Chris had to cover for me, and then it, it, was, it was his turn then in the rotation the first Sunday on New Year's Day last week. And so when two out of three times to preach, uh, I, I am not the one preaching. I, like, this desire and urge to preach just grows and grows, and I start thinking about all these different things and getting excited. So I'm, I'm especially excited to preach today. And we have taken this big break from the Gospel of Mark because we did an Advent series, which you know is kind of uncharacteristic of me to do an Advent series. We've only done it twice in the history of the journey. And we took a break from the Gospel of Mark, but now we're getting back into it. We're going to finish it out. We are in, in, in what's known as the Holy Week or Passion Week, that last week of events leading up to the death of Jesus. And so we're going to be studying this week all winter and spring. We're going to finish this up sometime in May. That's the plan. And I always ruin the plan before we get to the end of it. Likely there will be more sermons. I, I always end up splitting uh, sermons in half all of the time because I have a certain frame of time I try to preach in. But we're, we're going to cover this last week of the earthly ministry and life of Jesus, uh, the rest of the spring. It's going to be a very profitable time together. I'm excited to teach through this. Now, this part of Holy Week that we're studying today, where we left off, it's question day. Chapter 12 is question day. We're going to take verses 35 through 40 of chapter 12, if you want to go ahead and start turning there and having it ready. But question day is this day where Jesus is at the temple. He's at the temple, and he's going there to participate in Passover activities. That's why all of Israel is gathering to the temple there in Jerusalem. And Jesus, as a rabbi showing up to the temple, would take an opportunity to preach. Well, his adversaries would take this opportunity to oppose him. People that weren't fans of Jesus, they wanted to challenge him. They wanted to seize an opportunity to challenge him in front of an audience of people to make him look dumb, to make him look confused, to discredit him. Because the religious elite, or all of these different religious groups that we've talked about, they're jealous of the ministry of Jesus. They don't like the fact that people are saying, this is the Messiah, or could be the Messiah. They don't like all of the talk and all of the, the popularity, all of the attention that Jesus' ministry had uh, accumulated during uh, those three years of preaching and teaching and, and doing miracles. And so they want to confront him in the temple with an audience very strategically. The first thing they do is confront him in a way that's like, hey, who do you think you are? They're questioning his credentials in front of everybody. The head honchos are questioning his credentials. Then they come at him with a political question. Hey, what do you think about paying taxes to Caesar? That would have been a hot topic. That's a hot topic today, for that matter. But it would have been a really hot topic for the Jews, and we, we, we discussed that one. They came at Jesus with a theological question. What about the resurrection? Remember, they, they painted this least likely scenario, kind of a trick question to trip up Jesus, make him look dumb. And then they came at him with a legal question about the law, the Torah. What's the greatest commandment? These were all set up questions. And every single time they approached Jesus with one of these questions, they, 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 they thought they had him. Every single one of these questions, they were like, this is the one that's going to get him. We are certain we're going to get the best of him right now. He's going to be caught off guard. He's going to be speechless. People are going to see him mumble and fumble and, and, and look like an idiot up there. Every single time, they thought that was going to be the case. And each time, what they found out was Jesus was ready. He was ready. They were so mistaken. He was ready on a level that they weren't ready for. He bested them at their own game. He, he didn't just best them. He, he embarrassed them. Embarrassed them in front of this audience that they hoped to embarrass Jesus in front of. And so seemingly every one of these popular elitist groups had taken their shot at Jesus. Remember we had the chief priests, the scribes, we're going to talk about the scribes more today, the elders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians. Jesus had exhausted them all to the point in which the last verse that we read here, when we, uh, we're, we're in it in December, verse 34, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Like they were done asking Jesus questions. No more set up questions. 
We, we thought we were ready for this, but he was ready for us. We're not going to ask any more questions right now. That's a bad idea. You don't want to go toe-to-toe with this guy. We've tried uh, like our best of the best. Our, our best guys in each one of these groups have taken their shot, and it's gone really bad. But Jesus is like, no, 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 no. Wait a second. I'm not done. We're not done here. <laughs> I want to ask a question now. I wanna, I wanna, I've been on defense this whole time. I'm ready to go on offense. I want to take a turn. It's my turn to ask a question. So I want to take a shot at you fellas. And I think one interesting thing to point out here, this moment, this is the last, what we're, what we're studying today, this is the last public teaching of Jesus in his earthly ministry. I think that's significant, something just to think about. This is the last thing he'll be saying in front of an audience, an audience that's ready for him to teach or preach. And so he's going to have more teaching that we're going to study in Mark, but those, those teachings are going to be privately to his disciples. These moments are not going to be like these big public moments like, the, like it is right here. This is his final public teaching. The last time he'll be able to teach to a crowd what you think he would say, well, he's going to seize this opportunity to take a shot at the scribes and to target them with some teaching. The scribes, can you believe it? Well, the scribes, that may not sound too impressive to us, but in that day, to think that someone was going to publicly challenge scribes in a way that would like target them and, 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 and talk uh, negative about them, this would blow people's minds. I think it would help for us to take just a moment. I know I've described the scribes in the past, but I want to go into a little bit more detail about just who the scribes are. Remember, these are the experts in the law. The experts, the lawyers, these are the guys that their job was to know the Torah, the law. They were, they were to help interpret that to God's people. And these scribes were a really big deal. In that time and in that society, that culture, you could identify a scribe from a mile away. You knew them just by the way they dressed. They had these really white Linen robes went all the way down to their feet. At the, at the bottom of those robes were this white fringe. And so you can imagine in a sea of people how easy it would be to identify a scribe. It was like the power suit of the day, right? Uh, not like my, I got this at Target. <laughs> but they, they would wear the power suit. They dressed to impress. And when you could see them, Again, just a mile away, there's a scribe, there's a scribe. They were easy to spot. And so when they walked into a room, you were expected to stand in order to honor them. Even if you were like downtown at the coffee shop or at the marketplace, you're you're drinking your your latte, and suddenly one of these white-robed scribes comes walking by, you were expected to put your coffee down and stand up because you're you're a Jew. You honor the scribes. They are especially important to this culture. And these people would always want to honor a scribe. And so you would stand up. If you interacted with a scribe, you wouldn't just call them by their name. You would address them as rabbi or master or father. That was how you addressed a scribe to honor them. That's what would be expected of you. Anytime you had large social events, say you were hosting a feast at your house, you would especially want to invite a scribe. That was a prestigious thing to do. And when a scribe came to your home, regardless of all the guests that you happened to invite to your home, if you invited uh, a scribe, you would put them at the place of honor around the dinner table. They would sit, uh, if this was your household, you would sit them at your right and at your left because that is especially who you want to honor whenever you had that big feast. When you went to a synagogue, they also got the power seat in that setting as well. Whatever local synagogue you happened to be at, if a scribe was there, they would come, and and, and what you would do is when you walked in there, up front there would be this big chest, and that's where they'd keep the law or the Torah, and in front of that chest would be this big chair, like a throne almost, and that chair would have its back to the Torah and would face the congregation. That chair was for the scribe. That's where the scribe sat. When you walked into the synagogue, you would notice him right out the gate. This is the scribe. We honor this guy. We, we speak to him respectfully. We're careful 
with how we behave around a, a scribe because this means something in our culture. That's, that's who Jesus is about to target with his teaching. That's who Jesus is about ready to throw down with. So we, we just, I, I, I'm hyping this so that we can begin to understand how shocking it is that Jesus is confronting these guys publicly. And what he says about them, what we're about ready to read, it would, for a first century reader, it would blow their minds. It would blow their minds. It would be unthinkable. So we're just, we're just doing two things today. We're, we're looking at two sections of 35 through 40. The first section, 35 through 37, is a moment in which Jesus is about ready to give these scribes a taste of their own medicine. They've been trying to, you know, school and stomp Jesus, so he's going to take his turn. You know what? I'm going to school and stump you guys. That's the first thing we're going to study. The second thing is verses 38 through 40. Jesus is going to tell him what he really thinks. Have you ever been to the point, and I, I bet you, you all have, you know when you're in, a, in, a, in, co in conflict with someone and it, the, the conflict has been stewing for quite a while and you finally reach that breaking point in which you're ready just to get really honest with them? <laughs> you know, that, that point, the point in which it's, it gets a little dangerous in the interaction, the point in which you're just ready, you know what, I'm ready to drop the truth bomb. Here we go. Let's just put all this out in the open. Here's what I really think. That's what Jesus is about ready to do to the scribes. And it's not good. What comes out of his mouth, it would have been like, you would have heard a gasp after what he says. And so let's see what Jesus has to say. Let's study that first part together. This is when Jesus gives them a taste of their own medicine. He's going on offense. Let's read 35 through 37. It's, it's entitled, Whose Son is the Christ? And as Jesus taught in the temple... He said, how can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? David himself in the Holy Spirit declared, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord. So how is he his son? And the great throng heard him gladly. Okay. So again, I built, up, I built up all those dynamics so that we can begin to understand the tension and, and the shock factor in this moment. But as I read his, his attack, right, his, his offensive question here, as I read that, you might be reading that, and if you're like me, maybe the first time you read that, you're like, huh? <laughs> that was kind of a dud, right? I'm not even sure what he's getting at here. I'm not even sure what's going on. So first things first, um, the reason... This doesn't hit us as hard as it would hit them is because of how familiar they are with Psalm 110 and how unfamiliar we are likely with Psalm 110 in our day. So Psalm 110 is what's being quoted here by Jesus. And the question is surrounding this Messiah, this Christ, God's Messiah, God's Christ. Remember, remember that Messiah and Christ that just means anointed one, God's anointed one. In, in Hebrew, it's Messiah. In Greek, it's Christ. So that's what everyone would have been anticipating and hoping for in, in that day. Who's going to be this Messiah? When are we going to receive this God's Christ to, to deliver us and make all things right again? And, and so his question is regarding this one that they are anticipating. How can the scribes, these experts over here, how can they say that the Christ is the son of David? Now, if he would have stopped right there, this is, a, this is easy. This would have been like putting it on the T for, for the experts in the law. This is easy. This is a piece of cake. Had Jesus just stopped right there? Oh, man, you, you, could, you could imagine that at this point, the, the scribes are like, ah, ooh, ooh, I know, I know. They, they could have quoted all sorts of different passages of Scripture that say this Messiah or this Christ would be a descendant of King David. 2 Samuel 7, 12, Isaiah 9, 7, Jeremiah 23, 5. They could have just gone and go on and on and on and on. With these passages that reveal this truth, everyone believed that this would be a descendant of David. And so Jesus, though, has more to the question. He has Psalm 110 on his mind. And, okay, this truth that we all claim to know, let me ask you in light of Psalm 110. David himself and the Holy Spirit declared, okay? So David is the one who wrote Psalm 110. That's why he's referring to David. But did you notice that he ultimately credits God with this passage? That's so important. Let's not glaze over that. 
So Jesus, when he's making an argument, quotes scripture. That's so important. We, we should do the same thing today when we have an argument or a belief that we hold true to. We want to hold true to the word of God. And so he's, he's crediting God ultimately with this passage of scripture. But he's saying, here's what God is saying to us about his Messiah through King David. You know, the only way we're ever going to have unity in the church today, which there's a lot of disunity in the church, the only, our only hope at unity is by adhering to the same source that informs our beliefs, right? If some churches are informed by the word of God and other churches aren't, if some churches see the word of God as author the ultimate authority on our beliefs and other churches don't, we're always going to be at war. There's never going to be any unity. And so when we uphold scripture, when we stick to scripture, that is our effort to cause unity in, in God's church universally. And so sometimes when you do that, people will say, hey, man, you're being divisive. Well, the truth does divide. The truth does divide. It divides people who adhere to the word of God and people who don't add to, or adhere to the word of God. And we want to cause the, the church, God's children, to be informed by Scripture, and Scripture alone determines our beliefs. And so this is what Jesus is doing in his day. This is the same thing we should do in our day. And so they, he is appealing to Psalm 110, and Psalm 110 is your homework text. We're not going to go back and read it in its entirety. And uh, so, so later today or later this week, include it in your Bible reading plan, Psalm 110, read it in its entirety. It's not that long. But what this is known as is a messianic prophecy. That's just a fancy way to say this is an Old Testament verse that ultimately teaches us about this anticipated Messiah, the, the anointed one that God would send. This Psalm 110 is ultimately about him. And so this messianic prophecy is what was written by King David, and it's what Jesus is using to point to this truth that he's trying to get at. Everyone would have understood that. Like, the, the scribes listening to him would have understood this as a messianic prophecy. The crowd would have understood this as a messianic prophecy. The disciples would have understood this as a messianic prophecy. This is what the Holy Spirit inspired David to write to inform God's people about the Messiah. Everybody knew that. And evidently, everybody felt that way about Psalm 110 during this day, because when you look in the New Testament, Psalm 110 is quoted more than any other Old Testament passage. When you're reading through the New Testament... You see these indentations from time to time. That's because something is being quoted. That something is always the Old Testament. And so Psalm 110 is quoted in the New Testament more times than any other source in the Old Testament. And that's no surprise because it's a Messianic prophecy. The New Testament is teaching us about the Messiah. It's helping us to understand the gospel of God's Messiah, his Christ, which is Jesus. And so it's no wonder a messianic prophecy would be quoted so often, over and over and over again. And so here Jesus is. I'm going to quote this known messianic prophecy. It was written by King David. Did you notice how he refers to the Messiah? He refers to him as my Lord. David, inspired by the Holy Spirit, talking about this one who would come, ultimately. He doesn't refer to him as his son, he doesn't refer to him as his descendant. He refers to him as his Lord. Did you see that? The Lord said to my Lord. Why would David refer to this Messiah as his own Lord? Now, if you're, if you're flipping back right now, fact-checking me, reading Psalm 110, you're like, I want to get this out of the way right now. I'm going to read Psalm 110 right now while you're preaching. That's good. You're cross-referencing while I'm preaching. That's good expository listening. But you may have noticed a difference between what was quoted here and what you read in Psalm 110. There's a very subtle difference. When you read, my Lord said to my Lord, in the Old Testament, in Psalm 110, that wasn't written in Greek. That was written in Hebrew. And there's a something special that we see there that we don't see in what's quoted here in Mark because Mark is writing down the Greek translation of the Old Testament. So when he says, my Lord says to my Lord, he's using Greek words for my Lord. Says to, or the Lord says to my Lord, both the same Greek word. But in Hebrew, what he's quoting, and everybody would have caught on to this in that setting, the first Lord is in all capital letters and the second Lord is not. 
Why is that? That's because it's two different words. The Lord, in all capital letters, L-O-R-D, is the proper name of God. Yahweh is being translated there. Every time you see all capital letters uh, and, and Lord in the Old Testament, that is because translators are translating the proper name of God, Yahweh. So this, and so the, the other word for Lord that's used there in Hebrew is not the proper name of God. It's just the name or the, the word Lord, Adonai. And so essentially you could read it like this in the Old Testament. And this is what they would have heard in, in Jesus' setting. Yahweh says to my Adonai, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. Now hear what Jesus is not saying. He's not trying to make the argument that this Messiah is not a descendant of David. He's not making that argument. Jesus knows that the Messiah would be a descendant of David. As a matter of fact, we're reading in Mark, people, when they would interact with him in hopes that he was the Messiah, what did they say? Son of David! And he received that title, knowing that he was the Messiah. And so he didn't correct them and say, no, 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 I'm not a descendant of David. That's not what's happening here. That the, the Messiah is not supposed to be a descendant of David. No, he knew that it was supposed to be a descendant of David. And that's why we have these long genealogies at the beginning of most of our Gospels that point out the fact that Jesus is a descendant of David. So he's not trying to work against that. He's trying to say there's something more to this descendant of David. And we learn or get a clue as to what that something more is by the way that King David, inspired by the Holy Spirit, refers to him. This is David's Lord too. And so it's, Jesus is, is not less than a descendant of David, but he's much, much more than that. We know that because we have the New Testament. We've read through this and we study this all the time. But in that context, he is trying to teach these scribes in front of an audience, you don't know everything about this Messiah that you think you do. Yeah, he's a descendant of David, but how can you say that knowing that he refers to this descendant of David as his own Lord? How can he be the Lord of David and also a descendant of David? Tell me that, scribes. And they're dumbfounded. They weren't ready for it. They were the ones that were speechless. They were the ones that looked confused in that moment. They were the ones that looked... Uh, dumb in that interaction and these scribes got a taste of their own medicine what they had come to do to Jesus Jesus just did to them left them speechless and remember this audience that's watching too did you notice it said that they heard him gladly like these common folk that are watching this interaction they they can recognize that Jesus gets the best of the scribes, and that's what makes them glad. This is kind of like an underdog uh, experience. They're like, the, the underdog just, just, took, just took down the head honchos. Whoa! They would have heard him gladly. They, they were enjoying this. Did they understand his argument? Probably not. Like, I bet you they were just as stumped by what Jesus is trying to say as the scribes were. He, they, they, were, they, they weren't impressed by the argument as much as they were impressed that Jesus had obviously embarrassed these scribes. They're supposed to have all the answers. That's what their job is to do. But they didn't have an answer for what Jesus is saying. And the fact that they were stumped, they liked that. That was impressive. And so while Jesus is there, and, they are, and the scribes are scratching their heads trying to figure out what to say and and looking at each other likely like, uh, what now? What do we do now? Jesus takes the opportunity to do something else. He takes the opportunity to drop that truth bomb that I told you about. That's the second passage of scripture we're studying today. He's about ready to tell everyone in that crowd, including the scribes, what he really thinks about those scribes. You know that, that gif uh, that has all the teenage kids that you send when someone gets burned. Like, they're like, oh, and then one dude's doing like the fish gills, you know, going across this, you know what I'm talking, you know, you know what that gif is, right? That would be the gif, I don't know if it's gif or gif, you can debate that later, but that would be the one that you would send after you heard what Jesus just said to these scribes. He's about ready to throw down and be so honest with these guys, everybody would be blown out of the water, whoa! Skills. I don't know how, what, I don't even, what that even means, but it's funny. So 38 through 40, Jesus is like, let me tell you what I really think about you. Beware of the scribes is what this is titled. And in his teaching, he said, beware of the scribes 
who like to walk around in long robes and like greetings in the marketplace and have the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts, who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers, they will receive the greater condemnation. Whew. He's saying to these guys, oh, okay, let me tell you what I really think about you. You scribes, boy, you love your power suits, don't you? You just love it when people look at you in those. You love when people stand up for you. You love people looking at you in the, in the seat of authority at, at, at the synagogue. You love being the honored guest at everyone's house because that's what it is for you guys. You just love being thought of in a prestigious way. You love being honored. Wow. Wow. What, what, a, what heavy accusations. Like, when I read this, like, this hits me on a couple different levels. Like, man, every pastor better just routinely self-reflect through this passage of Scripture, shouldn't they? Like, ugh. How, how, many, how many pastors right now are just on a highway to hell because they aren't taking this serious? It, it, it's some of the best people I've ever met in my life were pastors, but I could also say some of the worst people I've ever met in my life were pastors. That's, I, I hate to admit that. That's embarrassing. But that's just me being honest. Like the harsh reality that we learn in Scripture is that in this world, there's a lot of people out there that are, that are just going to try to hurt you. There's a lot of bad people out there. And they're going to try to take advantage of you. They're going to try to manipulate you. And the reason they hurt you and take advantage of you and manipulate you is because they are interested in personal gain. That's, there, there's a lot of people in a lot of professions and a lot of, and, and a, and a lot of walks of life that are just that way. That's just who they are. And what Scripture says that's so shocking to us to be reminded of is that some of those types of people are your religious leaders. They are using this religion to hurt you. They are using it to take advantage of you. They are using it to manipulate you to advance themselves in some sort of way. And what Scripture says is that out of all of this group of people who do this, those religious people are especially dangerous. They're way more dangerous than the rest of them. Their crimes are especially heinous because they carry out their wickedness in a way that makes it look like they're doing something good. That's what makes them so especially evil. They're under the guise of good. And so, did you notice Jesus' description of these scribes? They are those who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. So just like today, like orphans and widows are among the most vulnerable people in this world. So this, it was especially so back then. The orphans and widows, especially vulnerable. And so what the, what the Jewish people would do as a way of practicing their faith, they would make a, a special effort to take care of orphans and widows. That's a good thing, right? That's a real, it's an especially good thing. So one way they would do this is they would assign these scribes to certain widows to make sure every widow was taken care of. That's a good strategy if you want to take care of the orphans and widows, right? But here's what they would actually do. Many of these scribes, in their assignment to a particular widow, boy, they would really love to be assigned to the wealthier households uh, uh, of these widows. And they would do this in a way and minister them to, to them in a way that would manipulate them and exploit them for their estate and for their money, for their possessions. They would take everything they had. They would pester them and pester them and pressure them into giving more, guilting them into giving more. They would be overjoyed to be assigned to a widow because they could apply pressure to the most vulnerable people in society and get what they want more easily. They saw it as a payday. And here's the worst part. For a pretense, they would make long prayers. Here's how they would cover it up <clears throat> and make it look good. After they got all the money they could possibly get their hands on, you know what they'd say to those widows? Can I pray for you? Hey, while I'm here, <clears throat> can I pray for you? Sorry, I need a drink. I got something in my throat. <clears throat> they would say, can I pray for you? And they would say all sorts of wonderful things in that prayer. They would say good things in that prayer. They would say beautiful things in their prayers. It would be an impressive prayer. They would say things that are true about God and, and perhaps even true about that widow. And it seemed so sincere and it was so articulate that these scribes, 
they were, they were able to make those widows feel good about this exchange, feel good about this interaction. Those widows, as a result of the scribes visiting their homes, they would probably feel more cared for even. But these scribes were doing something different. After, their, after they would get all the, the, their hands on all the money they possibly could, they would uh, pray for them in such a way to kind of Jedi mind trick them. And, 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 in, and in that society, scribes were thought of so respectfully that even as they were leaving these widows' houses, having taken more than they should have, people would applaud them. Look how wonderful they are. They were ministering to that, to that poor widow, and they would get applauded for doing evil. That's how heinous, that's how ugly this sin is. That's why they're especially dangerous. So how much of that still takes place today? Boy, how many of these TV evangelists, right? These multi-millionaires just shaking down poor people for everything they're worth day after day after day. Give, give me a little bit more, a little bit more. Reach in your pockets for a little bit more. And after they just shake them down day after day after day in all sorts of different ways, trying to sell them stuff, handkerchiefs and vials of water that were dipped in the Jordan River or whatever, you know, after just taking advantage of them over and over and over, you know what those TV evangelists say? Can I pray for you? Put your hands on the screen and touch my hand, and I want to pray especially for you. And boy, they pray the most polished prayers you've ever heard, don't they? After collecting millions of dollars years after year after year, after year and, and building their own estates and building their own savings and, and, and checking accounts to the point which they're overflowing, they just cover it up with all these beautiful prayers, thoughtful prayers. They say things that are true about God. They say things that are true about sin. They say things that are true perhaps about those people that are putting their hands on their TV screen. All for personal gain. They'll say whatever they want and whatever they can just to make sure you're not thinking about all the money that they just took from you unjustly, taking more than their fair share. You know what God says about these people that do this? People who use his religion to manipulate his people for personal gain, God says there's a special place in hell waiting for those individuals. Man, this isn't, this isn't me trying to be big and bad here. These are my words. This is what the Bible teaches. Those people that operate like that, there's a special place in hell waiting for them. They will receive the greater condemnation. All these wicked religious leaders today, they take and take and take. They just use Christianity to get rich and to make themselves popular and to build themselves up, serve themselves. They think they got away with it, and they think they're getting away with it. And the way that they even justify their actions when someone tries to criticize them, what do they say? Look how God has blessed me. Look at all of my millions of dollars. Look how big our facilities are. Look how much we have. They look at all of the theft that they've accomplished, and they use that to qualify themselves, to justify themselves, and they think they got away with it. They're fooling not only the people they're stealing from, but they're fooling themselves. And there's a special place in hell waiting for them. Jesus says when that day of judgment comes, here's what they'll say. The first words out of their mouth when they find out they didn't get away with it, are going to be this. Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Remember Jesus teaching this? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not do mighty works in your name? What will Jesus say to them? He says, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. We were never on the same team. You duped all them. You duped yourself, but you didn't dupe me. We were never on the same team. I never even knew you. Now, it's easy to take cheap shots at TV evangelists as a small-town pastor, right? But if you really want to live on the edge today, look at yourself and see if you see any of these accusations alive and well in your own life. Because they're meant for us, too. They're meant for us to comb through, to examine, so that we could self-reflect, not just the pastors, but everyone involved in this faith as we work out our faith. Is there any way in your life that you use the practice of your faith for personal gain in this way, so that you could be thought of by others and looked upon by others in a way that they would be especially impressed with you, that they would look upon your life in such a way that they would want to go out of their way to show you respect because clearly you have something going on in your life that they don't. Is that how you like to make other people feel? Is that how you like other people 
to make you feel when you practice your faith? Is there anything like these scribes that resonates with you or that you recognize in your own life? If you truly want to invite conviction and repentance into your life and you truly want to be intentional about this gathering, those are the types of questions we should be asking ourselves rather than pointing a finger at everybody else. We can do that, and rightfully so, as long as we're holding ourselves to the same exact standard. As long as we are equally as judgmental about the works that are carried out in our own lives, right? That's what Jesus says. Don't be overly judgmental in the sense that you hold them to a standard you don't hold yourself to. No, hold yourself to the same standard you hold them to and reflect on your own life and repent and, and confess when you see something like that in your own life. That is how this scripture is meant to impact us. It's to protect us from the especially evil people in the world, but it's also meant to protect us from ourselves, that we wouldn't trick ourselves into thinking we're better than we actually are, which we're especially prone to. So let's pray to that end as we close out the sermon. Lord, I thank you for this passage of scripture that is so powerful. This moment that was so intense as I try to imagine being present in this interaction, I just imagine the tension being so strong. I, I, can, I can almost hear the gasps. I, I, can, I can hear those scribes, and I can, I can just see them being just so offended. I could see their body language there, how appalled they, they were at hearing this. I could see the crowd as they become perhaps even just overconfident and maybe even enjoying the fact that those scribes were bested uh, in that way. But Lord, here's the truth about that crowd that loved Jesus in that moment. They shouldn't think that they're better than what they actually were because just in a few days they'll be the ones that are crying, crucify him. Just as, as fickle or just as unfaithful as those scribes. Lord, may it not be so with us. I don't want to be duped by my own warped heart. But Lord, I just ask that you would do a work by your Holy Spirit in our hearts and minds that we could humbly recognize these aspects of our life and that we could repent and confess. And Lord, I don't want to live out my faith in a way that would be arrogant or rude or unloving. And Lord, it's only by your grace that I can put that sin to death and live my faith out in a way that would honor you and actually truly help others. So Lord, I pray that that's what we would be after today. And it's in your name, Jesus, that we ask these things. Mm -hmm.